function? What are their habits and characteristics? In short, just what is a fish? The fish that are alive today fall into three major groups. The lampreys and hagfish, the sharks, skates and rays, and the bony fishes, such as the herring. We'll start with the most primitive of all, the lamprey and hagfish. They have no limbs or jaws, only a round hole for a mouth. Although they have a backbone, it is not made of bone, but flexible cartilage. Without jaws, they feed by attaching their mouths to their prey, rasping holes in the flesh with barbed tongues, and then sucking out the tissue that is being dissolved by their saliva. To reach the evolutionary stage of typical fishes, two great advances had to be made over the structure of the lampreys. Biting jaws, and paired fins. With the advent of the sharks and skates and the various types of rays, the vertebrates had gained jaws and teeth. Now, instead of being mere scavengers of the bottom, they could prey on the other active creatures of the water. One can get some idea of how jaws might have developed by opening up the gill area of a shark. These are the shark's jaws. Notice the amazing similarity to the gill bars. As you can see, it is more than probable that the jaws are derived from a pair of these gill bars that have become adapted to carry out this new function. You are now looking at a magnified view of a shark's skin. The little plates are called denticles and are essentially the same structure as the shark's teeth. It is probable, therefore, that the teeth of a shark were derived from denticles present in the skin of the mouth. The denticles have merely become enlarged and been used in a new way. With jaws and teeth, the sharks also developed the ability to move faster in pursuit of their prey. As in all typical fish, their propulsion is by sideways undulations of the body. Except for the sculling action of the tail fin, the fins are not used for propulsion. Instead, the shark uses them for steering and as stabilizers to prevent rolling in the water. The lampreys and sharks have skeletons of cartilage. But the remaining group of fish are the bony fish, with backbone and skeletons actually made of bone. The modern bony fishes are divided into two distinct types, the ray fins and the lobe fins. In the ray fin fishes, the fins are composed of only a thin web of skin that is supported by rays. On the other hand, the lobe fins, like the coelacanth, have actual limbs, for they have a fleshy lobe supported by a skeleton of bone. The strange-looking coelacanths were believed to have been extinct since the age of dinosaurs. However, in 1939, one was caught alive off the African coast. Since then, others have been netted and intensively studied. The other type of living lobe fins are the lungfishes. Lungfishes are found in only three small areas of the world, but within their limited environment, they are well adapted. For in the stagnant pools where the lungfish live, nearly all other fish would die for lack of oxygen. However, the lungfish actually possess lungs and rise to the surface to breathe air. Nowadays, there are very few coelacanths and lungfishes, and from an evolutionary point of view, it is the ray fins that have been particularly successful. One of the factors that has been responsible for the success of the ray fins are the fins themselves. A thin web of skin supported by rays. 
These give the fish much greater maneuverability in the water. The scales of most fishes are flexible overlapping plates. They give protection while being light enough and flexible enough to allow the fish to swim freely through the water. Fishes take their oxygen from the water by means of gills. Water taken in through the mouth passes out over the red gill filaments. Rich in blood, the filaments are able to absorb the oxygen from the water. If we open the fish, we can see the position of the heart. It lies just back of the gills and pumps the blood through the gill filaments. Inside the fish's mouth are a series of tooth-like bones, which act as a basket to hold and channel the food down the throat. Cutting open the throat area, we can see that the food will pass from the throat directly into the stomach. In fact, from the throat, it is a long continuous tube through the stomach and the intestines until finally waste products are emitted at the anus. In modern ray fins, the ancestral lung has been transformed into a swim bladder. This is a strong membrane filled with gas and is similar to the buoyancy tank of a submarine. By varying the amount of gas, a fish can remain buoyant at different depths. It simply floats in the water. If one fillets a fish, the fleshy part that one eats are the muscles. The rigid yet flexible backbone gives a firm support for the action of these muscles. And so most fishes are very fast and agile. The ray fins are found all over the world and live both in fresh water and in the ocean. Comprising over half of all vertebrate species, they have developed an enormous variety of body characteristics. The trunk fish, for instance, has bony plates under its skin, giving it a completely rigid body. The file fish, a bottom feeder, often drifts around in a vertical position. Well camouflaged, the trumpet fish will quietly stalk its prey among the eelgrass or, alternatively, float head down and wait for a prospective victim by concealing itself in a group of finger sponges. And this rock, over which the little striped fish are swimming, is actually a scorpion fish. The arowana is a mouth breeder, the fertilized eggs being stored and hatched in its mouth. Usually swimming near the surface of the water, its oblique mouth is well adapted to scooping up food from underneath. While some fishes browse on the algal plants and briar zones that grow over the surface of coral reefs. The remarkable looking seahorse moves through the water by rapidly undulating a fin on its back. Like this pipe fish, they have swiveling binocular eyes. These enable them to accurately judge the distance of their minute prey and suck it into their tube-like snouts. Apart from their widely differing physical characteristics, the ray fins also show remarkable variety in their behavior patterns. These grunts appear to be kissing. But in reality, it is probably a threatening pose when one fish intrudes on the privacy of another. Jawfish have a particularly interesting adaptation to life in the water, in that they live in burrows that they dig and line with stones. However, when one jawfish digs a burrow too near another, the fish that was there first appears to resent this intrusion of its territory and is determined to force the interlopers' evacuation. 
The first step in its campaign to intimidate the other jawfish is to steal the stones that are around the doorway and to use them to build up its own nest. Naturally, the newcomer resents this piracy, but as in most cases in nature, the larger or alternatively the more aggressive animal usually wins. The argument between the two soon results in an aggressive display. Finally, the original inhabitant of the territory seems to feel it necessary to drive the interloper away. It invades the neighboring burrow. The newcomer is forced to evacuate. The victor then returns to its own hole and snaps at the defeated rival. The puffer fish scares off its enemies by enlarging its body with water. This causes its quills to stand erect and provides a formidable deterrent to any aggressor. When the danger is past, the puffer gradually returns to its original, more streamlined shape. But not all fish are as well endowed with such a protective device and predation by one fish on another is a constant danger in this world of the waters. Apart from this direct approach, there are some fishes that employ an artful guile. The anglers, for instance, in addition to a deceptive camouflage, actually go fishing. They have a highly specialized spine and when they are hungry, they extend a bony filament from their head to act as a fishing pole. At the end of the pole is their bait, a fleshy appendage which they vibrate, making it look like a wriggling worm. Small fish attracted to the bait are taken in a mouthful. The queen trigger is a fish that will eat almost anything. Algae, coral, mollusks, even a spiny sea urchin makes an acceptable meal. But killing an urchin is not a simple operation. It will try to wedge itself between a crack in the rocks, and it has very sharp spines. The trigger keeps pulling it back into the open. Then it carries it up into the water and drops it. If the urchin lands on its back, the trigger will move into the attack, for the sharp spines are shorter on its underside. However, the urchin keeps managing to right itself. Until finally, it is not quite fast enough. Quickly, the trigger smashes a hole in it with powerful jaws. It does not take long to eat out the urchin's soft insides. Soon, there is only a hollow shell surrounded by the now useless spines. One of the interesting commensal relationships is that of the shrimp and the goby, for they both occupy the same burrow. While the shrimp shovels dirt out of the hole like a small bulldozer, the goby stays quietly at the entrance, but always on the alert for danger. Dancing enticingly and wriggling its antennae, the little parasite-picking shrimp signals that it is hungry. Fishes come and settle quietly on the bottom to have the parasites clean from their scales. They hold themselves quite rigid and even open their gill covers so that the shrimp can get underneath to seek out and eat the parasites. These shrimp have definite stations and often several fish will line up for this cleaning job at the same time. Then there are fish that clean other fish, little line gobies 
that have what appears to us the invidious task of cleaning the parasites off such dangerous creatures as the vicious looking moray eel. However, the moray has no use for the gobia's food and is much more interested in having its irritating parasites removed. When cautiously approached, some fish are somewhat similar to squirrels in the park and are apparently quite content to be handled. Unlike most of the animals of the land, they do not seem to fear man's presence. Whether they actually respond to affectionate handling or whether they are merely inquisitive is not yet known. In most fish, the process of reproduction follows this general pattern. First, the relatively elaborate courting procedure, as in the courting of these angel fish. This induces the female to lay her eggs. The eggs of these sergeant major fish have a purplish color and cover the rocks. After the eggs are laid, the male swims over them and fertilizes them. And sometimes the male will stand guard over the eggs until they are hatched. These tiny freshwater fish are Aresius latipus. The female has just started to spawn. The development of a single egg cell into a whole fish is a fascinating process, and a study of this process helps us to gain new insight into vertebrate embryology. The eggs of these small fish are as transparent as glass beads and are therefore ideal for microscopic study. Here are the eggs before fertilization. The sperm look like tadpoles, their size about three one thousandths of a millimeter. The sperm cells move briskly about the egg. This is the minute opening where the sperm will enter. A sperm cell penetrates the egg. Another tries to follow, but it will be shut out. Only the first sperm to enter the egg will affect fertilization. Following fertilization, there is a rapid change in the egg's protoplasm. The globules of oil, which serve as nutrients during later stages of development, fuse and move downward, while the protoplasm gathers at the upper end of the egg to form what will become the pre-embryo. The first cleavage or cell division of the egg now takes place. The pre-embryo continues dividing into numerous cells. then gradually spreads over the yolk. Twenty-six hours have elapsed. The developing embryo has now covered three quarters of the egg and a rhythmic movement has begun. Thirty-six hours after fertilization, some of the new cells have gathered together to form two parallel lines. These lines indicate the border of the neural tube, which eventually develops into the brain and the spinal cord. The top end of the neural tube bulges into two directions to become the eyes. The space between the eyes is the developing brain. Fifty hours after fertilization, the heart is merely a small tube and beating very faintly. But no blood is running through it since the blood vessels have not yet been formed. 56 hours after fertilization, the cells near the heart undergo a change and begin to form blood vessels. Blood corpuscles are rapidly increasing in the region and suddenly the blood begins to flow into the heart and circulation begins.
The heart beats powerfully. As the blood is pumped through the body, it carries with it the nutrients that will accelerate the growth of new organs. By the seventh or eighth day, the body is almost complete, with all the internal organs ready to function. The tenth day, the embryo is now moving briskly within its enveloping membrane. The eleventh day, the embryo breaks out of the shell and a new Aresius latipus has been hatched. The young fry will become an adult fish in three months. Then it too will begin spawning. What is a fish? There is no simple answer. But we can say that it is an active, swimming creature with a backbone and that it is characterized by having fins and scales. We might add that fishes exhibit interesting and complex behavior patterns and abound in such variety that their species outnumber all other vertebrates combined. All these factors and more add up to an extremely successful animal, the fish.